for the next few minutes, allow me to just uh, share what God has put in my heart. I'm going to, we're going to read two passages of scripture this morning. I'll start from Isaiah chapter 9, which is what Ken had just touched on. And then we're going to read Luke chapter 2. And then we'll see what uh, words God has put in our heart. So I'm going to start from Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 9 and from verse 2. And then I will read Luke chapter 2. These are all famous or well-known passages of scripture. And they are normally read during Christmas season. They are not entirely new to us. Um, I will read. You can follow along in your own version or translation that you have. Or on the screens. Uh, which has the New King James Version. I'm reading from the NIV. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. And I'm going to go all to verse 6 just to save time. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with righteousness and justice from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Then Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, <clears throat> a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because <clears throat> there was no room for them in the inn. Let's just pray for before we proceed. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that we celebrate the day when the Son of God became man and for a while he lived amongst us. And as John says, we beheld his glory, the glory as that of the only one and begotten Son. But he was rejected, but as many as received him, have been given the right to become sons of God. And while we celebrate the son of God who gave himself for us, we also celebrate that we are now sons and daughters of God. We pray that as we look into your word this morning, the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome him, let him shine in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, I don't know about Nairobi. I've lived outside for a number of years, so I may not be familiar with the traditions here. But in the UK, this particular season of Christmas, all the primary schools normally start organizing the plays around the nativity. So everybody will be organized in terms of how they're going to uh, play out the story of the birth of Jesus. And 
Of course, the most popular one, uh, popular characters that all the children like going for is Joseph and Mary. Every child, boy, girl in the schools always hope that they will be offered the opportunity to be Joseph and Mary. But then if they fail to do that, um, they don't mind being offered the position of a shepherd. Yeah, I'm happy to take care, to, to be a shepherd. Or some of them are happy to come in as angels and say, okay, I will, I will take on the angel. Or even the wise men. That is good. So first of all, Joseph and Mary, angels, shepherds, wise men. Beyond there now, nobody really wants the other positions. Because the other positions are, somebody needs to be a donkey. The one that ferried that transportation that was used. Some people need to be not shepherds, but the sheep. And nobody really wants that position. The other one is, some of them need to be the cows in the manger where Jesus was born. So it is very easy to fill up the first ones and very, very difficult to fill up the other ones. Out of all of that, there's also one particular uh, position that people don't like going for, and that's the innkeeper. And the problem with the innkeeper and why a lot of young people don't like that portion is that the innkeeper has only got, in the whole play, he has only got one line to deliver. And then he disappears from the whole scene. Only one line. And can you imagine you're going back home and you're telling your parents, I'm in the play about the nativity and they ask you, so who are you going to be? And you say, innkeeper. And then you say, so what are you going to be doing? You say, I'm just going to come out and just issue one line. No room in the inn. And they say, is that all? Yes. Could you not be Joseph? No, Joseph was given to my friend and I really don't like him. What about Mary? Well, the, lady, the girl who was better in maths was the one who got it. So this innkeeper is sort of, it's better than being a sheep. It's better than being a cow. It's better than being the donkey. But the problem is you only give one line. No room in the inn. So in one of these plays, one of the boys was an innkeeper. He had hoped to be Joseph, but he didn't get Joseph. He ended up being an innkeeper which was a challenge for him because he really liked the girl who was given the role of Mary. And he knew the perfect position for him was to have this little girl that he liked and him occupying the position as Joseph. He knew that would just make his day. But he was only given the innkeeper's role. So the play continued and at the point that his role came in, Joseph and Mary is of course on top of the donkey and they've come to the inn and this young man is now looking at Joseph and the girl that he really likes and he knew his one line is, are oh, you forgotten? No room where? In the inn. But as he was looking at Joseph and Mary, he forgot his line. And he said, no room for Joseph, but Mary can come in. <laughs> so, he ended up getting Mary. But he gave a new translation on the story of the nativity. On another play, one of the boys as well was acting as the innkeeper. And when Joseph and Mary came to the inn, what was his line? What was he supposed to say? No. And so this boy encountered Mary and Joseph, and he remembered what he was supposed to say. So he waited for Joseph and Mary to request a room in, the, in his inn, and then he remembered his words. He said, sorry, Mary and Joseph, there is no room in the inn. And everybody thought, perfect, he got his line. Simple. Just one simple line and he got it. But then, 
After some time, he rushed after them and he pulled them back in to the inn. And everybody was wondering, now, what's, what's happening to this boy? Because that was not according to the script. So when they went home, the parents asked this boy, we really loved, you know, parents, you're supposed to encourage the children. Even when they, you know, that artistic impression was really not enough, you still want just to impress them and encourage them. So he asked the boy, so how, how was the play? He said, yeah, it's fine. And did, did you remember your lines? Yes. And were you supposed to invite them in the inn? And he said, no, I was not supposed. Did, do you remember the story, how it goes? He said, yeah. They were not invited in the inn. They had to go in where the animals were. So why did you do that? Why did you invite them in? That was not part of the, the play. And this boy said, well, I looked at Mary and Joseph and I remembered that Jesus was being born. And I said, I couldn't, I couldn't keep Jesus away. I had to invite them in. So I know it's a bit of a fun, but one of the things when we read these stories, one of the challenges that we, we have is we can easily read these stories after the event. Have you ever heard of the phrase after the event? Because we are reading these stories because we know the end. I like the way Pastor Daniel was saying it was a fulfillment. We know the end. I don't know whether you've watched a movie with somebody who already has watched the movie. You feel like kicking them out because sometimes they're telling you what is going to happen and you're telling them, please keep quiet. I need to really take in the movie. Don't tell me that this person is going to die. I don't want to know. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we are reading after the event. We can always assume that we know the end. We know how it's going to happen. And I'm sure some of you have got friends like that. I've got somebody in my house, and I'm not going to mention names, who never allows me to finish my story. Because she wants to get to the end. Let's know what happens. Anybody else who's got friends like that? Yes, I can see hands, people who are genuine. Don't worry, if they're, not, if they're here, you're, you're in trouble. Some people, they just finish the story for you. You, you. you are saying, okay, so are you going to finish the story or you are going to allow me to tell the story? And sometimes we do that because we, if we do that, we end up glossing over. We end up missing out important bits about the story. Now, Luke, when he writes this gospel, he writes saying, after carefully investigating this story, I am putting together an orderly account so that we may really understand the life of Jesus Christ. In other words, Luke is keen to present to us a credible account of what happened. Now, if you have people here who are of a legal profession, you would understand what it means by having a credible story. A credible story means if somebody listens or reads your account, it has got what they call a ring of truth. Now, so you read it and you say, that looks like a good story. That looks like it's a true story. Allow me to give you an example. Suppose a police officer, you're a police officer, or you have been called to a scene of crime, and on your way to this scene of crime, you meet somebody running away in the opposite direction. So you apprehend this person because the circumstances are leading you to suspect this person. They are running away from a scene of crime which you are now have been called to investigate. And when you sit this person down to ask them to give their account of the story of why they are running away from the direction of a scene of crime, they can tell you, for instance, I was running away because I need to attend a job interview. Now, as a genuine police officer, what you will do is you will go and possibly find out which company he was going to be interviewed and ask them, why are you expecting Mr. So-and-so at this particular time? Now, if that company says, yes, indeed, we were expecting them, and this is the time that they came in, they said they were late, and they looked to be, they were sweating. In fact, we were wondering, we told him to come down, to have a cup of tea, to have a cup cold glass of water. You as the police officer will come back and say, that person has given me a what? A credible account. But if now you 
this suspect had said they were going for an interview. And then the police officer investigates and finds out that this company was not expecting this person. They don't know him. They don't know his name. Never received an application in his name. If you show them the face, they say, we don't know anybody like this. Then you as a police officer now know that this person's credibility is in doubt. So when you present the case to the judge and you would say, I didn't see this person stealing, but I caught him running away from the scene of crime. And the story he explained to me was that he was going for a job interview. But when I pursued further his line of argument, the company that he suggested said they did not know anybody by that name. So now what you're telling the judge, you're inviting the judge to make a decision based on this person's lack of credibility. And so Luke is writing to us to give us an account that the things that happened as we celebrate them happened. Now, I don't know about Kenya, but where we live in the UK, people always say, no, the Christmas story never happened. This is all myths. These are stories that were made up. These were stories that were invented by these writers. And one of the things we throw back to people like that is we tell them, well, if you are writing, imagine with me. Taimajini. Are we together? Imagine with me. I mean... I can confess I have been guilty of lying before, but God has saved me. But imagine you're writing the story of a wonderful king who is going to be born. I want to ask you, would you put in the stories about him being born in a slum? You would want to say this king was born in Nairobi Hospital the private wing, a team of qualified and experienced doctors and nurses because he's the king of kings. That's how you would make up the story. Hello? You wouldn't start saying that, oh, there was a girl who nobody knew. She came and told us she's pregnant because everybody will be thinking, when you're making up a story, you, you don't go down that way. Are you getting me? You, you don't go down that way. So the only reason why Luke, Mark, and Matthew wrote this account in the way that they did is because it happened exactly that way. They had no, nobody would come up. Why would you come up if you're inventing a story? A lot of you watch movies, don't you? All the time in the movies, can I ask you a question? Does the hero die or he always wins? Is the hero handsome, attractive, tall, chiseled jaws, looking nicely? True? Why? Because they want you to watch the story. It's not true. They are just after your money. But Luke and the gospel writers are not writing to impress us. In fact, some people argue, remove the virgin bath and we'll accept the story. But Luke and the other gospel writers are not looking for acceptance. They're not looking for their story to be seen among all the literatures that have been written. Oh, this is a nice way of writing a story. No. They are writing something that happened. A man who was born and lived and died and changed the course of humanity. And they were not making it up. So much so that they were willing to die. They were willing to lose any property and their lives because of this man's story. I'll give you one more example. When you write, when they write about the resurrection, none of them in the resurrection story look nice. If you were Peter, you would not want people to write in the resurrection story that you betrayed Jesus and ran away. Hello? If you are the disciples, you would not want people to write that you are locked in, in a room, fearful, depressed, thinking your life is over. And the only reason they wrote those stories was because 
That is how it happened. They didn't care about their reputation because something happened through the life of Jesus that changed the world for eternity. And because of that, they were happy to stand by that story and say the things that we have seen and heard, those we also write to you. And we need to be careful we don't lose that powerful testimony that they give to us. Because it struck the chord of the society at that time when you're coming to tell people that there's a girl here who's carrying the son of God. In that society, that girl, Mary, would have been stoned to death. So why invent a story like that? One more detail that looks adds, which is what I'll concentrate on and then I finish. He then says in this story, Jesus was born in a manger because there was no room in the inn. And this is what Luke is trying to show us. When this child was born, he didn't have a big sticker on his head saying, Behold, this is Joseph and Mary. We are carrying the soon-to-be-born king of the kings. Please make way. There was nobody who cleared the roads for them. There was nobody who noticed anything unique about this girl and this man. And, Joseph, and that's why Luke says there was no room in the inn. There was nothing. Do you know in the Bible in Isaiah where it says there is nothing that we looked at him that attracted him to us. And I just want to throw three things at you that I learned from the way Luke writes this story. First of all, when you read the Christmas story, I know nowadays we like decorating our houses and giving gifts. But this story was a difficult time for Jesus. Can you imagine you're being born and nobody wants to know who you are? At least when you're born in hospital, they put a tag on your leg. True or not true? Somebody identifies who you are. You have somewhere, if an expectant lady comes in, they can be ushered in. But the picture is of Jesus approaching people in an inn. And they can see clearly Mary expectant. And they say, sorry, we have no room for you. And throughout Jesus' life, he experienced rejection. And he dealt with people who didn't like him and pushed him away. One of the things that we must appreciate as sons of God is that people just like Jesus may never accept us, may never receive us, may never roll down the red carpet for us. Hello? And Jesus, if you remember, there are times he used to tell his disciples, foxes have holes. But even the son of man does not have war. Does not have somewhere to lay his head. He experienced rejection. He dealt with rejection. But I am happy that even though he experienced it, he never gave up. I like the verse in Hebrews that says, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3, Consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. The point of Jesus going through that rejection, he is an example for us. If he went through all of that as the son of God, I want to tell you something. You will experience rejection hard times from sinful men. People will say things about you that you don't like. Hello? People will gossip about you. People will sabotage your business. People will put you down. But the Bible encourages us from Jesus' example. Consider him who endured such opposition. From what? From sinful men. When people do that to you, and sometimes you ask, what kind of people are these? The Bible has got an answer. They are sinful men. But it says, don't lose heart and don't grow weary. So the first point I give when Luke is writing to us here, he wants us to know Jesus went through a hard time. And as Christians, we will go through a hard time where we don't give up. We don't lose hope. We stay focused. Amen? And I want to encourage you this morning, if you're going through a rough time, Christmas 
you're looking around at everybody sounding happy and looking excited. They're thinking, what is there to be excited about? I want you to unite with this child that we're celebrating today who endured a difficult time so that you may not grow weary, so that you may not lose heart. I want to encourage you, keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Don't give in. Learn from the example of Jesus. He did not grow weary. The second point I want to throw at you, that sometimes what we look at in the natural realm is different from what is happening in the spiritual realm. In the natural, we could look at Jesus going through rejection and going through difficult times. And our human inclination is to say, like Isaiah said, we considered him stricken by God. Sometimes we look at people who are going through a hard time and our immediate conclusion is that person does not have God's blessing. I want to challenge you to be very slow to judge people who are going through a bad time or a difficult time and say that God is judging them. Because that's not true. You may think on one level you're experiencing pain, but my brother, on a human level it may look so, but on a spiritual level, God is at work in your life. Jesus was going through rejection after rejection and there was imminent death facing him. And it's very easy for us to say, Surely a savior cannot operate this way. A savior would trample over all his enemies. A savior would not allow himself to be hung on the cross. But I want to tell you at that very time when we judge Jesus, God is working through him. And by his death, our salvation has been brought to all of us. From the suffering of one man, we have salvation for all. So I want to encourage you. The first thing that Jesus did, yes, go through rejection. But the second thing I want to say, we may look at something from a human point of view. But I want to encourage you is also to look at it from a spiritual point of view. I want to remind you of what Je Joseph said in Joseph chapter 50. He told his brothers, you intended to harm me. That is what looked in the natural. When you threw me in the pit, you are not throwing me to offer me a promotion. You are throwing me to harm me. When you are selling me to a slave, you are selling me to slave masters because you wanted to destroy me. And sometimes you may ask, why would God allow this boy? Why would God allow me to go through all these difficult times? But I want to tell you something. Joseph came back and said, I know what you are trying to do, but I recognize what God was doing all along. And I want to tell you what you've been going through, your pain. Maybe it's diseases. Maybe it's loss of work. Maybe it's loss of your um, relationship. God is the only artist who knows how to take tears, pain, suffering, death and paint a beautiful picture out of it. Have you ever taken sometimes some raw materials to some workers or, or a tailor and they tell you, no, I can't work with this. I want to tell you something. You can bring your pain to God and, says, and he says, I can work with that pain. You can bring your demotion to God and God says, I can work with that demotion. You can bring your rebellious children to God and God says, I can still work with your rebellious children. Because on a human level, things may look like they have gone out of control. But on a spiritual level, God loves those kind of raw materials. When people say, this is impossible, then God says, step aside and see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords working wonders. He has a way of using your pain of using your rejection, of using all the things that you have gone through. Humanly speaking, people look at you and say, you can't make it. I'm here to say, God knows how to take those things. And he says, bring them to me. All you who are heavy, burdened, and laden. And I will give you rest. He says, you who have no money, come and do what? 
So I want to encourage you this Christmas. Bring all those things that hurt you. Bring all those burdens that wear you down. And say, God, what can you do with this? God, here's my son. He doesn't listen to me. What can you do with him? God, here's my marriage. It doesn't seem to be working. What can you do with this? And I want to assure you, God can work out wonders in your life. Finally, the last point. Luke says there was no room in the inn. And I want you to picture for a moment. Picture for a moment Mary and Joseph standing at the door of the inn. And all the people looking at them and enjoying their meal and their evening. And saying, well, sorry, you should have come in early. We came in early. We deserve a space here. You should have come in early. And they would feel entitled to explain that. But think about this for a moment. What if, what if, what if they had known that Mary was carrying the Son of God? It would be a different scenario, wouldn't it? Yeah? And the, my third point is this, that sometimes God comes to us in so natural ways that we miss him. Sometimes God comes to us in very natural ways that we miss him. Remember the story of Jesus after resurrection, walking with his, with his two disciples, walking along with him, and he is explaining to them about the Bible, what happened, and they never recognized who he was. Why? Because Jesus came to them in a natural way. If some of us were writing that story, because we really want an effect, would make sure there is a carpet in front of Jesus so that these people are certain that Jesus has risen from the dead. But that's not how Jesus works. Jesus comes to them naturally and says, let's walk. And it's only as he continues breaking the story and explaining to them that they realize, oh my, this is not just a man walking the journey with us. This is indeed Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. You remember when Jesus gives the story of the last day and Jesus condemns those who never visited him and they ask him, when were you a prisoner in prison so that we refused to visit you? In other words, they were telling Jesus, if you had a big sign, <laughs> if you had a big sign, or if you had a big label on your chest saying, I am Jesus in prison, we would visit. They would ask him, when were you in hospital and we didn't come to visit you? In other words, they were telling Jesus, if you had told people you are admitted at the Nairobi hospital, oh, we would come and see you. But God, Jesus comes to us in such natural ways that we are in danger of missing him. And this is a story I'll tie it very quickly. I've got five minutes left. This is why I tie it with Isaiah chapter 9. Because in Isaiah, he promises joy and light instead of darkness, rejoicing instead of gloom, freedom instead of captivity. But he says, that will only happen because a child is born to us. Now, the world reads that and completely says, no. We would like a better label, not a child. We want Building Bridges Initiative. We want Jubilee. We want NASA. Or in our case, we want Brexit. We want remain. Surely God has to intervene through remain or Brexit. But God says you will only experience joy, freedom, peace only through the son that has been born. He's saying that is the only door to true freedom. That is the only door to true 
forgiveness, to true joy, to true peace. But the whole world looks at that and says, no, no room in the inn. So my question to you is this. Will you make room in your heart for this child? Will you make room in your heart for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? John says he came to his own and for a while he lived amongst us. The beauty of this story is this. God is asking us to give him room. But actually, it is God who's making room for us. God, I'll say that again, God is asking you to make room for him, but actually, really, 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 it's God who all along, all along, has been making room for us. I would rather take that, I'd say, that is a deal I'll take any time. If I make room for God, and he's making a massive room for me. I hope that you will have a Merry Christmas. I hope that in this Christmas, you will make room for God. Know that only peace and joy and freedom comes to this child who has been born. A son who has been given. All this happens through the son. You can choose to look away and say, there's no room. You have to find a better way of working. Or you can say, yes, I have tried all the other doors, but I'm going to try this door today. I am going to say, Jesus, you're the son who has been given for my freedom. You're the son who has been given for my peace. You're the son who has been given for my joy. And I may not have everything that I would like, I may not have a Christmas that I would like. I may not even give my children the Christmas that I would like. But I know you are able to take all these pieces of frustration, all these pieces of pain that I go through, and work out a beautiful picture. When God is asking us to make room for him, it really is him making room for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that God became man and lived for a while amongst us. And in that particular event, God has changed the history of humanity forever. We now have a place in the throne room of God. Like Jesus says, we can approach boldly and ask anything. Father, I pray that those who have heard me today, that we would give our hearts to you. That there would be no room in our lives that you do not have absolute control over. Because when we give our hearts and our lives and our minds to you, actually, Lord, it's you who's giving room for us. Room to enjoy you forever. Even though I walk through the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You have created that room for us. And I pray, dear Father, for people this morning who are listening to me, who may be carrying bags of frustration, of pain, of fear, of disappointment, of disillusionment. I pray that this Christmas, they will bring this to you and say, God, what can you do with this? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those that love him. And God will paint a beautiful picture. Those who are in darkness, a great light has shown. Rejoicing instead of gloom. Freedom instead of oppression. Peace instead of disharmony and war. For unto us, a child is born. And a son is given. And he is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And on his government and peace, there shall be no end. 
It may not look like it that way, but I know I'm assured of eternal life. I may not be the richest person on, on the land, but I am assured of eternal life. There are things that you have worked inside of me because of the son who has been given to us. So we bless you and we honor you, dear Father, today with our minds, with our hearts, with our lips, with everything that we are. We praise you and we glorify you because of this son that has been given. Jesus, on this day, there is room in your heart and in your life. There is a place in your heart for me, Lord. Amen. Amen. I would like to say, have a Merry Christmas. Thank you for listening to me. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Come on, let's appreciate a guitar for such a word. The